Okay. Uh, now we're at the uh, stage of the process where the panelists will elect a chair and a vice chair. And so I would like to begin by asking the panel uh, if there are, are there any nominations to be the chair of the chap on phthalates? Okay. <clears throat> well, the, the chair is uh, responsible uh, for the overall conduct of the committee and for organizing it and to s see that the the work, the various uh, parts of their assessment are done in a, in a timely manner. Uh, they will work, of course, with the support of the CPSC staff. Uh, we will give them all the administrative and other support that we can. Um, the chair is a, a, a very important, a critical, uh, a critical position. Um, they will help shape the overall uh, uh, assessment that the chap will be doing. Uh, the vice chair will be there to assist the chairman and to uh, uh, help them with any uh, uh, their responsibilities uh, as needed. And the, the, the chair, uh, once the committee uh, once the chair is elected, the chair will, uh, for example, help us to schedule the future meetings and how often to meet and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, so the chair is, is a big, uh, big responsibility and very uh, important. And of course, uh, we all know that the chair of a committee such as this, uh, uh, a good chair makes all the difference. Um, so, uh, does the panel have any other any other questions? It has to do with the budget. Um, yes. So you were saying the chair is going to help decide how many meetings there are and things like that. Is there a budget for us to meet on a well a regular basis? Or is it well, to be more? I think we needed to see uh, uh, get the panel together, brief you, and uh, see what. The, the panel in the chair thinks we will need, um, how often we will need to meet. This is, uh, uh, because this is uh, so much bigger in scope than our previous chap, uh, we only have that experience to go by. Uh, as far as uh, the budget goes, uh, you know, we plan for a certain number of meetings in terms of travel expenses and so on. Uh, there isn't a, a particular uh, amount of money necessarily set aside for things, but whatever the chap needs, we will ask for um, is is the process we use here. Um, okay, any other questions? Um, can we, uh, any uh, discussion or should we, uh, do, would anyone like to make a nomination? Yeah. Could I nominate Philip Mercus for chair, please? Okay, uh, we, in, we have a second. Uh, okay, so we have a nomination. Uh, are there any other nominations to be the chair? Uh, uh, w is there any discussion? Uh, Dr. Marcus, would you like to maybe say something, or is there any other discussion? Well, this is, uh, this is clearly a, a huge task for uh, anyone to, to lead up this committee because uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the charge is, is quite extensive. And so we're going to have to, uh, as a committee, really uh, define exactly what it is we we think the charge should be and then how we're going to carry it out. Um, uh, I've worked on uh, NRC committees and uh, I've been a director of a center so I have some
experience with uh, handling processes like this, so um, I'll do my very best. Thank you. Um, is there any other discussion? Uh, okay. Uh, I guess uh, all in favor of Dr. Marcus as the chairman of this CHAP, please raise your hands. Okay, so we have one, one abstention. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, <laughs> um, and uh, now, uh, do we have any nominations for vice chair? Would anyone like to make a nomination? I would. I'd like to um, nominate uh, Bernard Schwetz for uh, vice chair. Okay. Um, would anyone like to second the nomination? Okay. Um, is there any any discussion? Uh, Dr. Schwetz, would you like to say something? Well, just to say that I'm honored to be on CHAP to begin with and certainly honored to be nominated to help run run the the process. And I've known Phil for a long time, and uh, I would be happy to work with him as the vice chair. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, all in favor of... Dr. Schwetz as the co-chair or vice chair. Okay. Thank you. Well, con congratulations. Uh, Dr. Mercus is our chair, and our vice chair is Dr. Schwetz. And uh, Phil, if you would be so kind uh, as to take over the the meeting from now on it this is your meeting uh, you you can speak from your chair or you can speak from here uh, whatever you prefer okay. sure now this is the first slide and, uh, you know, this is a, a bullet version. Um, you all have the actual language um, in your binders uh, uh, that you can also refer to. What's uh, us CPSIA one oh eight? And where is it there? And the the description of the chap uh, begins on uh, let's see. The third page? No, no, no. The bottom, actually the middle of the first page is where uh, under number two is chronic hazard advisory panel. All right, I thought the, the best way to, to proceed is just to start with these bullets, uh, one at a time, and uh, flesh them out, decide uh, how we're going to uh, fulfill that bullet, and then proceed on to uh, the next one. Uh, it's pretty clear that this may not be accomplished uh, at this session or tomorrow, but we'll, we'll make a good run at it. Question? Chris? Um, what I'm looking at, maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. 
it looks like this is more description of the panel itself and not so much what's listed here. Is there other language for this? Um, oh, under, under, uh, yeah. B? B, exam, B examination. There are like eight charges, right? Yeah. Eight charges? Oh, I'm looking in the wrong place. Sorry. Uh, it's called CPSIA uh, 108. You might be on the... Uh, Yeah, so the first charge in, in this uh, document is examine all of the potential health effects, including endocrine disrupting effects of the full range of, of phthalates. So <laughs> that in, by itself could be a book. Um, so who wants to, uh, to speak to this in terms of beginning to establish uh, an outline for this <clears throat> particular point? This may actually be in the wrong direction of what you're really interested in, <laughs> but um, you know, from some of the work that we've done previously on the um, uh, NCR on phthalates, it was clear that through some of the discussion that there are other chemicals that may have similar effects to phthalates. And our thinking at that time was n not to focus too narrowly. Um, so even here, just to say, just to look at phthalates when there are other chemicals that may you know, have similar effects, are, are we starting off even from the beginning by focusing too narrowly? Or, uh... Well, we can all chime in on this, but my feeling would be that if, if we start off with the universe, we're, we're going to be difficult to proceed. So we're going to have to limit ourselves in some ways. <laughs> to make this a, a project that's manageable in, in two years' time, I would think. But please, let's have your comments now. Yeah, um, if I could, my uh, view of this is that uh, it, it's a huge task that you have. And it would be, uh, I'd be happy just to, to see you accomplish that. If you want to broaden the scope, uh, even though it's important, I mean, I wouldn't say no to it. But, you know, just understanding the, the, the breadth of this, I think to look at just phthalates would be a wonderful start, uh, if you, even more than a start. Um, uh, I won't say no, but I also, uh, it, my understanding is the other chemicals uh, uh, are mostly um, pesticides, in which case they're, you know, not in our jurisdiction. And again, not that that's not significant. Um, but I'd, I'd, I'd start with what we need to do first, uh, but I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't rule it out. I, I see both sides, both, both concerns, and maybe I can uh, propose a middle way. Um, I also think it would be too much to broaden the scope and to subject uh, a number of potential other chemicals to the same degree of toxicological examination. However, I, I think Chris is right, and this was one of the key points of the NRC report. We <coughs> have to protect ourselves against the danger of examining a totally artificial problem. But I think uh, in, in only focusing on phthalates when in the real world there are other exposures which may actually exacerbate the effects of phthalates may. There's some evidence to suggest that. I think to salvage this and to serve both um, both these opinions, uh, the way out of this dilemma would be to focus on phthalates, so leave, leave the <coughs> scope here, but take the other chemicals into consideration under the rubric of background exposures. So with specifically asking the question, do we have evidence or reason to believe that co-exposure to other existing chemicals might actually exacerbate the effects of phthalates? Would that be a compromise proposition? Which could largely lead to um, some kind of a factor adjusting for the fact that there are things that we're not accounting, Possibly, yeah. accounting for. But to address that in sort of our thinking might make it seem more realistic and less 
I think in number seven, which we probably won't get to for quite some time, I think you could probably bring it in there where it says in using sufficient safety factors to account for uncertainties regarding exposure, susceptibility. I mean, you could, you could think that other co-exposures to chemicals that have similar biological effects could be brought in there. That, that's so. what I had in mind, yes. Yeah. One thing that I think we're charged with <clears throat> is finding out if there are any phthalates other than those six that have already been reviewed by your staff that warrant further consideration for potential limitations to exposures or inclusion in products. So as a minimum, I would think we have to have information on the other phthalates beyond those first six. And if that convinces us that we should be looking at other chemicals that either potentiate the effect of one of the phthalates or in somehow in some way modifies and makes ex other phthalates more toxic, we can keep our eyes open for that. I think if we start searching for those now, that would be a major task and make it harder for us to evaluate your first priority of knowing whether or not with those six do we need to include that list to more than six. And as we look at the other ones, I would add to what was just said, in addition to the amount of them in the environment or in body tissues, that, that may identify some that are very, that are out there in large amounts, but we would also find then that they're not very toxic, possibly. So we need to look at the amount that's out there, but also the inherent toxicity of those that are beyond the six, so that we would give specific priority to those that are the most common and those that are the most toxic and see if there is one that's most common that's also most toxic. And that would, that would be a way of looking at these other phthalates. You mean outside of the six, in addition yes. to the six? Well, I think that makes perfect sense and I probably should have started there identifying which phthalates we were going to focus on and I think that's a good point, Vern. That we'd a question about support then f yeah. from the CPSC. Can we get the reviews done on the other phthalates? Well, I mean, it's sure. Do we know what the other phthalates are going to be? I mean, we, we need to, I think, yeah. you know, of, of all the phthalates in the universe, I think that there's 10 that people have identified in the biomonitoring studies. I don't know if that means there we're only exposed to those 10, but at least we know that. Um, and somewhere in here, in the overview tab, the second to last tab, uh, I think I give a list of the, of the uh, on page 22 of that tab, I have a list of the phthalates that have been identified um, in biomonitoring studies. Uh, so we can start uh, by looking at that. Um, uh, there's a couple others. Uh, I mean, I think Dr. Well, diisobutyl. I know Dr. Koch has uh, uh, might have have some. Uh, there's another one, DPHP. Maybe we could add to the list. Uh, so that might be uh, a, a place to start is to look at the phthal, <coughs> and if you want us to look at the dimethyl and diethyl, uh, certainly. So we could look at essentially anything on this list that we haven't already color covered. Probably should then spend uh, a few minutes or, or whatever it takes to identify um, Phthalates that we'd like to have research done on in terms of literature. Any um, want to, we want to include all those in Table Nine? Um, yeah. Um, in. in Are you looking for the tab? May I add something? Okay. So we have this 
the list of the three phthalates which are banned and the three with the provisional ban. So I think that's uh, obligatory for us to, to focus on. Then we have on uh, page six of the slides, it's slide 18, so I think we should focus on those that have been identified to provoke the phthalate syndrome in, in rats. So additional to this is um, diisobutyl phthalate as a mandatory one. And then, of course, we have, although they are inactive in the, in the rats, we have some hints for the low molecular ones, like the ethyl and the methyl phthalate. Those should be included. Russ, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. And looking at the higher molecular weight phthalates, so that's the DINP and DIDP, we have an additional one that's the propylheptyl phthalate, which is a C10 phthalate, which is also on the market now. So these are phthalates in a first look, just in terms of exposure and uh, toxicity. Reasonable. But still goes, Chris's fundamental problem looking at it in isolation, I, I don't know how we can look at anything global in terms of other compounds and classes of compounds. It drives us crazy. No, it won't, uh, because it hasn't driven us crazy uh, on the NRC panel. We've done it, and we, you can, you can, we can build on that expertise. So you want to build on the, what the NRC panel did to, to basically pare away the other chemicals or agents of concern? Yeah, there is a body of knowledge available, not only in the NRC Fine. report, which, uh, which would help us to, to achieve that. So. All right, if, if you want to do it that way, I'm more than happy to agree to that because I think we have a fundamental agreement that we can't do everything and we have to use some other bodies, resources to ensure that we can focus on phthalates effectively. So I, I have no problem with that. And, and I, I, I would agree, and I, I think that a starting point should be on the phthalates. And on the NRC panel, that's what we basically did. I mean, we really started with the phthalates and then I think brought in the other chemicals that, that may act through similar mechanisms or similar common adverse outcomes. So, And the, I mean, this report, too, could be a, a, a framework that could be built upon. Uh, you know, other chemicals can be added later, too. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you, you don't have uh, forever and, you know, uh, you don't have unlimited resources and so on. But, but let me just assure you, Paul, we are not uh, reinventing wheels here and we are also not starting from zero. So yeah. there's really a, That's good. a body of knowledge. Yeah, and the, I mean, the method, the NRC report really is a how to go about doing this. Right. Yeah, it, it, it makes our job so much easier then. Even though it's still daunting, it makes it a little bit easier. But still, I think we need a consensus on which endpoints we are focusing. Well, that's a good point. I think that's the next step. That's it. Yeah. Uh, before we go there, I was a little slow. Uh, what is our list of phthalates now? Uh, table, nine Back to table nine that we were just looking at, right? I think. It's page 23, right? Yeah. yeah, fine, thanks. Are there, are there others there besides? Uh, well, Table 9, uh, there's also, they're mentioned on, on slide 18, but I think they're really the same or maybe not entirely the same. Um, uh, it, it's basically anything in Table 9 or on slide 18 that isn't already covered by the, the first six. Uh, plus DPHP, di-2-propylheptyl. Di have we, uh, in this way, uh, answered Burns' concern that there may be other phthalates? Well, Burns, do you think this is? Well, ta table nine is the things that are identified in human urine. I don't know whether there could be others that they just don't measure. I don't know that. But those are the ones we know that people are, are exposed to. Um, and also, I mean, you're looking at 
uh, really two different things. You're looking at total exposure, and you're also looking at the children's products. And some people, you know, this is all uh, subject to interpretation, but some people, when it says the range of phthalates used in children's products, some people take that to mean the, mainly the three interim banned ones. But again, you can, that's open to interpretation. Aren't we getting ahead of ourselves right now? Then? Uh, sorry. Let's, let's, sorry. let's stick on number one. Yeah. <laughs> So, from my notes this morning, did you say that there were roughly 30 phthalates? Well, that are as far as I can tell, uh, there are 30 commercial products. Um, my understanding is that half of these are high production volume chemicals. I could try to confirm this. Um, in the biomonitoring studies, there are these, you know, 10 that they measure. Uh, and, uh, and you're talking about like an NHANES? Uh, and Haynes in other studies. I mean, nobody, I don't think anyone measures all 10 of them at the same time, but there's a total of 10 that have been measured. So, but my understanding from the N. Haynes is that those chemicals were selected for study based on things like production, use, and also likelihood of, of effects. Okay. Um, do, do we know for sure that those that aren't considered there really? I don't know don't. <laughs> for certain, but I can, you know, I think we know who to ask. The list of metabolites analyzed is always a state-of-the-art thing, so you only can analyze what you have to metabolize for. I would propose to our circle here to maybe have a look at table three in the overview on page four. And I think this is a good list of all the relevant commercial or irre irrelevant commercial autophthalates. So um, I think this would be a good approach that we can tick these phthalates, which are, which we think, with our knowledge, to be relevant. Which table are we talking about? This one, Older. table three. Table three. Page, three. Four. page four. four. So this is nothing to do with biomonitoring, so or it is has to do with chemicals. those that are present or not present. As I understand it, what we're asking for here is information about what data are available right. on these. Right. But why just the orthophthalates? Well, the, I mean, these are the ones that have, um, uh, have the effects from peroxisome proliferation to the male developmental toxicity um, as, a, as a class. I mean, that's the concern. Um, and these are the, the plasticizers uh, that have been used uh, for many years. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, some of the substitutes are the terephthalates. Um, and they're actually covered in the substitutes part. Uh, it's simply, uh, when people talk about phthalates in, uh, you know, they're really, they're usually talking about the ortho phthalates. Chris, did you want to add to that list of, I mean? I'm not the person to ask about that. I was just trying to make sure that we knew when we said phthalates, and this is ortho phthalates. No. Um, but, you know, maybe if we're, if we're starting to talk about what the list is gonna be, if we could include, you know, we, we got to this list from these assumptions and largely what Mike was just said of things that we could include. Right. We can build that justification from what he just said. Um, I mean, more than likely, uh, this list of 30, uh, you know, once you get past those six, you're going to find less and less data anyway. Actually, it'll, it's going to be more than six because you can see the isomers, so it'll be approximately ten in the end. Any other comments? Do we know what the universe looks like now? It's blue. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's windows. Oh, is it orange? <laughs> the orange. Just orange. Go ahead. 
So, so should we go through this list and discuss? We, c we can't you know, consider all of the delays there on the list of table three. Do you want to go through it or? Do we want to think of it like the six and then those that aren't in the six? What, yeah, what like other this. than the six, yeah. is there anything other than that that we ought to be looking at? I mean, or we can go straight to table nine as you suggested originally or? No. No, no. we can't. All right. Why not? Table nine was on page what, 26? Again, we're, we're not what? going to use this list to determine effects of each one of these or in, in, in a combination, but rather just to ask uh, them to prepare information for us. What is, what is known? Is that, am I correct on that? Exactly. Yeah. So I think in terms of going through them one by one, uh, that's probably for a later date. This is just so, yeah. We we are discussing now which phthalates to focus on, right. and we've agreed table the ten phthalates list listed in table nine are the ones that are sort of minimum. Correct. I don't know if we agreed on anything yet, but that sounds like a fair way. It's to a start. minimum, yes. Yeah. But biomonitoring doesn't cover everything. True. No. So well, how do we want to proceed? Do we want to say let's start with those in table nine and then we have to prioritize the rest? Uh, uh, other than Table 9 and, and one or maybe one or two more, uh, there, there's probably not going to be a lot of, certainly not going to be biomonitoring data and no. in, in not much in the way of exposure anyway. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm not sure what we would find out about them. I mean, we can look, but, um, you know, I, I don't know how much there's going to be. So, but still, going back, you know, this just says the, that we're supposed to be looking at the full range of phthalates that are used in products. Yeah. Um, well, it says the full range of, I think, the full range of phthalates used in children's products. Um, does it say that? And I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is confusing, to say the least. Yeah, well, Mike, that can't be totally correct because we're also going to be looking at pregnant women. Right. So uh, that, well, that's going to bring in exposures from a whole variety. That's right. That's right. True. We can't focus only on phthalates and children's products. I totally agree. Well, it seems to me that if, if we're going to be transparent in terms of the list that we finally come up with that we're going to focus on, we, we need to start off as broadly as we can and mm -hmm. just have a, a, a literature search. And then once we have that, we can say, well, for yep. X through whatever, uh, there's just not any information that we can go on. So, you know, we don't discount that they might be a problem, but we don't have any way to assess it. And then we would focus down on our, our short list. Okay. Sounds that makes fair. sense? Yes. We go. And especially if there's if if there's some explanation of why the others haven't been studied, is it because of some structure that makes them not likely to have an effect, or you know? Yep. Any information that we can we can include in our report. Yeah. Good. Okay. One. Yes. Go ahead. In terms of commercial importance, could we get production numbers? Oh. We can try. We can we can try. I mean, of those thirty, I th you know half of them I believe are high production volume chemicals, and we can try to get the the latest uh, information from EPA on that. <clears throat> yeah, that that might be the only information that we have in, in order to judge whether or not to pursue a particular chemical. But could, could that actually be part of our um, conclusion at the end is that, you know, especially, and I don't know if the high production chemicals are the ones that have been studied or are there high production chemicals that really aren't studied or haven't been studied? And if that's the case, you know, maybe part of our conclusion at the end of the day is we, we have to judge based on data and there are data gaps. Yeah, of course. 
and these are the gaps that we find and I assume that's going to be a big part of our final report is what are the data gaps that you know either prevent us from, from making a, a judgment or um, I won't say the alternative okay any other um, <clears throat> Comments on on how we're going to proceed in terms of identifying the, the phthalate <coughs> family. Not then I think the next uh, task would be to move to that first bullet, um, <coughs> and and start to talk about uh, <coughs> what potential effects are we going to be focusing on and requesting uh, information about. Well, wouldn't that go back to? Number one, the information requesting number one include that because then we have I, a, I, yeah a, I suspect it would because uh, if we're going to look at them or we're not going to look at them we're going to have to know what the yeah. potential effects are from the get go yeah but would your search I'm, I'm just thinking from from my perspective of, of developmental toxicology since this. CHAP is really <coughs> focused heavily on, on exposure to children. Um, would your literature search pick up uh, the effects of phthalates on, on development and reproduction? Would that well, it, I mean, it, it would if they're, if they're in um, ToxNet, you know, the National Library of Medicine databases, <coughs> we will pick it up. Uh, the, prop, the, the thing is, most of the, the literature, on, in the de, especially for the developmental studies, it looks at multiple phthalates. And so there's probably, you know, for the phthalates, uh, um, for these other ones we're adding on, if, if there were a lot of data, we probably would have seen it anyway. It probably would have come up. So, um, you know, certainly we'll look. But I think that, uh, you know, if you just do a search on Earl Gray and Paul Foster, you'll probably come up with all the relevant data anyway. A question to follow up on that. The concern that we always have in, at this time about unpublished literature yeah. that are relevant is in your interactions with those two individuals and in the laboratories that they represent, yeah. Do, are you aware that they have unpublished data that would be important for us to be aware of? Well, you know, there's always stuff going on. I know that, the, well, uh, uh, they're testing more and more compounds to see if they're active, active as they call them. Um, and I think we can uh, certainly expect to see more in the future. We can ask them. We can invite them to come at a, to a future meeting and, and present. Mm -hmm. um, uh, certainly that's a possibility. I wasn't thinking so much of ongoing studies as a study that was done 10 years ago and it wasn't exciting, so it didn't get published, but it had valuable information. I mean, all we can do is ask. Yeah. Um, a lot of, I mean, there's unpublished data that's submitted to EPA uh, that would come up in, a, in our searches, but um, other than that, that's, you know, yeah, it's hard to account for. What we don't know, and all we could do is uh, talk to p as many people as we can. Am I correct to say that though Paul Foster and uh, Earl Gray would be largely focusing on reproductive chemicals that may have an effect on reproductive? Yeah, the, 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 well, have... specifically the the male developmental effects. Developmental. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if we if we're interested in other health effects. Oh, well, we would yeah. to search for the chemicals and we'll do that. Another, another issue is having access to um, ongoing or planned studies. I know that we, we talked about the fact that there are studies ongoing at uh, EPA and, and NIEHS. I think we need to uh, see if we can track that information down just so we know what is going on. Does okay. it get published? We can certainly do that. What about uh, non-repro and development endpoints, cancer, for example? 
uh, you know, there, that, there are data. Absolutely. So we look at it. Good. Um, definitely. Comments? Yes, one comment um, about this cancer endpoint. Um, there is a school of thought or, uh, saying that if you look at uh, which effect is probably the most sensitive or which group of effects turns up first as you escalate dose, it is uh, developmental and uh, reproduction. Um, but there may be one or two examples where that's not true. Yeah, I think there's a lot of examples where that's not true. I mean, for the ones that cause these effects, that's often the most sensitive endpoint. But there are others that don't cause those effects. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, clearly people are most concerned about those the male developmental effects, the phthalate syndrome, and the possibility that uh, phthalates cause the human analog of it. Uh, but um, not all of the phthalates have those effects. So you're, you're kind of torn. Um, you know, do you look at these effects? Because that's where the concern in it is and because that's where you know that the effects are additive. Or do you look at other effects uh, like liver toxicity, which it, it may be more common, and when you add them all together, uh, may be more significant. And I meant it in a slightly different way. Uh, if you look, for example, at DINP, um, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think that would be an example where cancer effects occur at lower doses than reproductive effects. Right, right. Okay. Should all be captured in, in the literature we're going to be. Yeah, yeah. I just wonder, is there any other, uh, I'm only aware of developmental reproduction and cancer, but I just wonder, it's may, just my ignorance, whether there's another group of effects we should take into consideration. Well, I, in the other, there's uh, in chronic studies and 90-day uh, studies, you see effects in the liver in the kidney uh, mm. are common. Occasionally you see something else. Uh, well, you see, of course, testes in, in certain ones. You see occasionally thyroid or something else. Uh, and, uh, but the, the liver and the kidney are the most common. And they're often, the sensitivity, the doses are, are very close to the doses where you see the developmental effects. In uh, humans, there's concern with respiratory effects. I don't, I'm not that familiar with the tox literature to know if studies have been done looking at in inhalation exposure or, but there's, there's studies I know that are ongoing and have been published where they've looked at, you know, asthma or wheeze in relation to phthalates. Yeah, there was a couple where, well, the Bornhog looked at, um, asthma, rhinitis, and uh, eczema. Um, I think those, they're not real strong studies, and, you know, people have looked at uh, uh, various kinds of immunological endpoints, and, you know, there some effects here and there, but it, it, it's not really, I mean, it's, obviously, it's a concern. People, some people would say that that's important. I think that the other uh, endpoints are a lot more strongly established. I think the same is the case with other effects that uh, have been found based on epidemiologic hints like obesity or diabetes. I think we should, it's not current uh, view that, that these effects really are caused by the phthalate, so we might keep it in mind, but uh, I wouldn't put any focus on it. But if you screen the last two years on phthalates effects, some based on enhanced data and uh, biomonitoring data and epidemiological data, you come up with these effects like obesity, diabetes. Uh, the asthma story was a bit before that, but I think 
But I think, I mean, it, I think it brings up another point, but we probably, I, I agree we shouldn't probably go there, but when you say effects on children's health, you have effects while the child's a child, and then potentially you have delayed effects where, you know, obesity or asthma, you know, decades later, um, you, could, you could think about. And I think it, it probably, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's important for us to maybe define all the potential effects and then limit ourselves to the ones that, that we have data that we can okay. make statements yeah. on. In the, yeah, I mean, the, the reviews that we've done so far cover everything, um, you know, almost to a fault. <laughs> uh, Do you have a table? <coughs> a table? Of the yeah. effects? No, well, the effects versus the chemicals of concern. Uh, really, uh, let's see, in the... On page five of the slides, there's... Yeah. Pardon me? On page five of the slides. Uh, there, there is a, a slide, and there is something in the... Um, in the overview, if I can find that. Yeah, you have it on page five for some of them. In the overview on... I think that's for the 10. Chris, that's for the 10, not the rest. In the, in the overview, I'll, I'll bring up the slide. In the overview document on page nine, uh, it gives uh, some of the main endpoints, but again, it doesn't... There's no way to, you know, you'd need a mile, page a mile wide if you put in everything. Um, so those are the, the highlights, the ones that uh, kind of uh, uh, jump out. Um, you know what I worry about, though, is um, I think it's only been more recently that people have started thinking about mixtures in a more um, systematic way. Uh, whereas if we're looking at papers that are, you know, rel somewhat older, um, they may be looking at effects of a single chemical at a time and saying, oh, there's no effect on obesity or diabetes or, some, or respiratory or whatever, and, and it might not show up. But if they started looking at it more, you know, as a combination, maybe they would show up. Um, I, I don't know how to get around that <laughs> except to go back and think about each of those older papers or older, and maybe it's not older, but just, I, you know, I, I think it's, it would be possible to miss effects in the literature because things aren't thought about as a combination. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that, that, I think, gets us, unless we want to say more about the uh, world of phthalates, to the next point, which is individual uh, versus cumulative risks. Um. <clears throat> well, there was the one before that. Yeah, number three. Uh, <clears throat> that was going to the likely slide. explode. Oh, okay. okay. I think number three is likely levels of children's populations. Okay. Pregnant women's and others' exposure to phthalates. If others is <laughs> makes it very broad. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm not sure if that means the general population or other sensitive groups. Oh, I was I was looking at number two there. Have we talked about that? I mean, I assume that the, the literature search that you're going to do is going to pick up both studies with individual phthalates as opposed to combinations. Yeah, correct? well, so uh, we'll get pro all that. Pro probably uh, all just individuals. I mean, the combinations are, we probably already found those, so, yeah. Very few. Could I just ask a process? In terms yep. of a process question about the, these literature searches, is, is the purpose then that you're going to be giving the panel the original articles or synthesizing the data? Or well, both, I think or? this is, this is what, the, uh, uh, up to the panel. Um, I think for starters, we're going to look to see what's there. Because for some of these phthalates and some of the endpoints, there will be hundreds of papers. 
Okay, because I think for... In, in wrath, you know, in the okay. toxicological literature. Yeah. Yeah. But we've, you know, well, we've probably covered the, well, most of the big ones. I mean, yes, yeah, some of them are going to have a lot. Some of them are going to have very little. Like DHA, DHP will have quite a lot, but yeah. uh, MM or DMP probably not. Yeah. yeah, right. And now while we're doing this, I mean, th there is working go going on at mm -hmm. EPA, and we will uh, see, I don't know what exactly what the timing is on all of their work, but, you know, we, we can sh maybe share some resources too. Um, but I mean, they're not in the they're not in the binder. But on your CDs, we have the reviews of the of the six plus the well the overview document and the couple of other studies that we did. Uh, so that's that's on your CDs, and, and we can uh, you know it's too big to put in the binder, but we can if if you like, we'll print those out and, and ship them to you if you like, if that would help. Um, so you don't, you don't have to carry them back, but uh, we've got that, and then we'll we'll start working on uh, expanding the the scope. For clarification, I would ask, <clears throat> what is the purpose in including pregnant women? Yeah. Sometimes pregnant women are included not because there's a concern about the physiologic differences between pregnant and non-pregnant women, but are included only because of the sensitivity of the conceptus. Yeah. In which case the target is not pregnant women, it's really the conceptus prior I, to birth. I, I think, uh, you know, my interpretation is that they're concerned about the conceptus. Then we shouldn't create an expectation that we're going to look for the sensitivity of pregnant females to the phthalates, because that's not what we would do. Okay. Now, it's it's possible that their expo the the pregnant woman's exposure patterns might be a little bit different, which would impact the fetus. That, but, that's fair game. Yeah. But not just pregnant women because they're pregnant. That's that's not a that's, that's not a high priority. For I us. I think that's what they're getting at. The, the task I see here is what are you going to be using as the baseline for what levels are? Are we doing biomarker levels? We'll be able to get data from NHANES to begin differentiating whether or not there is a significant difference between pregnant women exposure and non-pregnant women's exposure? I mean, there's, there's limited data on exposure to pregnant women yeah, yeah. and children under six. Right. Uh, well, these are the likely categories that number yeah. three yeah. are directing our attention to, and that's going to be an awfully hard yeah. data set to acquire. There's going to be more uncertainties and well, more gaps than anything else. Uh, that's why it would be really nice if um, the National Children's Study got going really fast, because they're going to get those two populations. But there are quite a few studies on pregnant women. I know Columbia, Mount Sinai. Yeah, well, there, there, are, there are studies. Yeah. There are, yeah. there are Apart studies, from NHANES, yeah. just not um, as extensive as NHANES. Right. But, but still, the pertinent question is what is meant by level. Uh, it can mean two things, uh, internalized dose or tissue level. It could also mean intake. I think in, to resolve this, we have to focus on both. Yeah. There are attempts in the literature, Russ is the expert there, but it is possible, and Holger as well, it is possible to calculate back what the uh, <coughs> likely exposure was on Absolutely. the basis of metabolite level. So, but we need the other dose metric intake as well in order to make valid comparisons with um, results from animal studies, etc. So is that our understanding then, shall we agree? Level in the sense of intake as well as tissue levels. No. Yeah? No? I, I would be less, you've 
I'd be less optimistic about thinking we could go back to where the exposure came from because we don't know what the sources are. I mean, we can literally say that a person's been, we may be able to characterize the, the cues in which we can put pregnant women or, you know, the baseline exposures that may lead to, may, where you may have a, a dose of X in the body, but to go extrapolate back to the sources, I, that's a daunting task and no one's accomplished it for any chemical yet. So, no, there is uh, information about phthalates, how to do this. Very there, good. there is information, but it's, it's no, data. Once, you, once you get back to trying to figure out where the exposures came from, you're dealing with, uh, you know, inhalation, dermal, uh, ingestion uptake, so therefore you have different uh, degrees of uh, assimilation and bioavailability, and we don't have that kind of information. So I think trying to go backwards at this time is a little bit more funky than you might think it is, but it's something worth pursuing, but I think that's a lot of research. Yeah, but is, I mean, it says consider all the available yes. sources, but it, if you have biomonitoring data and you know what the total exposure is, you don't necessarily have to know how much of it is coming from each source. You don't necessarily have to do that. I mean, to look at the children's articles, exposure from that, you might have to do a ground-up scenario-based thing. If, if, we, if we're going to move from three to four, we have to be really careful. Yeah. Because four talks about total exposure, and I just want to be clear that we're not going to get that from going backwards from biomonitoring data. We just won't have the capability. Right, right. right. It's not possible at this point in time. Well, the pharmacokinetics is... and the data just don't live there. Maybe we need comments from yeah. Olga and Russ here, but as far as I know the literature, this is what you just said is not state of the art. We are further developed than you think we are. And that's, and that's part of our task, I think, is to say that. Uh, where, where are we and what can we and what can't we do or say? So. so it's a point that we have to consider. Yes, absolutely. Let's leave it but, at that. But there is, there is some data. I mean, I agree that it's all not there, but there is some in terms of that question. So. In terms of biomonitoring and dose extrapolation, yes, there is data, but I, I still have to uh, say yes to what Paul said, that uh, we are still on the quest for identifying real point sources sometimes. So um, there is still a lot of things to do, especially if, wanna, if we want in the future, say we should restrict the use in this and that product. Yeah. No, 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 I'm not disputing that. I know, I know well, that's, that. That's but we are... Yes, I know. But let's say we have a broad feeling of what the likely exposure can be. Yeah. In the median and also in the upper percentiles. Right, uh, that's what I meant. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, from the, from the urinary metabolites, you can say what the person's total exposure is. That's right. With reason, w within reason. As long as you know it's a single biomarker, you have all the biomarkers established for right. that one particular R chemical, you could probably make an estimate. It doesn't mean that it covers the distribution of all populations. I, I'm just being careful here because yeah. we can overshoot the you know, we can overshoot it and come up with numbers which are not meaningful when you get to a, a large population. Yeah, well, ec what you're saying here, sure, there's, there's data. For whom and for how much can you, who can you extrapolate to? I, think I don't think the data is there to do very good extrapolations. I do reconstruction modeling all the time from biomarkers back to exposure. None of the chemicals I work with except for lead and that's under very limited circumstances. Can I get back to what the exposure no, is? No, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think what you're saying is, which I agree with, and I think Holger said as well, that we don't know the proportional contribution to what's in that individual's body or urine. So we don't know, are 2% coming from personal care products, 20%, 3% from air, 30%. I, that I agree. We, I don't think we know that. There's been, you know, a handful of studies, but... 99% of that we don't know, but I think we, we do know, you know, what levels are 
in different segments of the population in their urine. That's fine. Yeah. That, that, that so I think I we're agree agreeing that, in I terms of the, the gaps. Yeah. You can look at their various populations. But the proportional contribution and the specific source, yes, we, we don't know what's most important or most relevant. And we still have to keep in mind that the population be below three years of age is not very well covered by human biomonitoring data. When you say not very well covered, what do you mean? You can't get blood out of them easily or urine. Oh, that's right. right. That's, that's <laughs> the problem. What about from breast milk? Right. Turning human biomonitoring, that's a very difficult parameter. Right. How many, you know, how many kids are getting 90% of their milk from breast milk? And infants. Well, infants. I mean, they're all different ranges of, of people who use or do not use formula. Courage, but it's not necessarily uniform. I, I just think with biomonitoring, we have to really be careful not to over emphasize certain things that we cannot do with it. There are certain things we can do with it, but we have to be really careful. And, I, and Helger's right about the issue of, of very tiny, very young children, because, you know, we can't get, I mean, I've tried to take urine samples from, from infants, and uh, it's a daunting task trying to take all those diapers. <laughs> it, it, it just doesn't, it's just not an easy thing to do. Really isn't. Can we discuss grasshoppers again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, well we, we've gone from grasshoppers to diapers. What the heck? Yeah. But yeah. It, it, it is very hard, Chris. It, and we we tried it, and it's it is a it's a real daunting task to get good urine samples from 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 infants. Yeah. In the well, the the back calculation to the intake you can do for adults, uh, for infants. Who knows? Uh, in the same thing, pregnant women, you know, the physiology and everything. Um, who uh, I don't know if you can accurately make, do that calculation for those populations. Okay, well, I, I, number four is not going to get any easier. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, consider the cumulative effect of total exposure to phthalates. Can we get EPA to do this for us? Other sources. <laughs> Can we give decline? Something to do? No, I would like I would like to assure you that it it sounds difficult, but uh, we it is possible to do. There is an enormous advance of knowledge in this area. It has been done before. This is a topic of ongoing research. We're not going to start from zero. Uh, we can build on something. What are we building upon? Yeah, could you summarize what? What's out there? Briefly, first of all, the NRC report, which is a, if you like, a review of all the mixture studies, both with phthalates, combination of phthalates, combinations of other antiandrogens, and combinations of phthalates with other antiandrogens. And put briefly, the body of knowledge so far tells us that it is possible to fairly accurately anticipate the effect of a combination of any of these chemicals if you know uh, the potency of those chemicals individually. individually. Mm -hmm. So the, the, it is possible to adopt uh, this kind of predictive approach fairly validly. That's quite amazing. So well, basically additive? Uh, mostly dose additive, yes. There are... The, uh, our own group and configuration in Europe, uh, we've uh, thrown a spanner in the works by, it's a recent paper where we hit upon a synergism um, between one phthalate, DHP, and a combination of other antiandrogens with respect to one endpoint, and that is hyperspadia, malformations of the penis in the rat. The same mixture produced concentration additive or dose additive effects with respect to all other relevant endpoints in the rat. We currently have no explanation why this particular endpoint should show a synergism, but that's one finding. 
But apart from that, most other joint defects have been dose additive. So, which is very important because it may open the door now for modeling approaches rather than investigating each and every combination of chemicals again and again. Um, we, we are now, I think, at the level where modeling is a real possibility. Paul was next. Well, I'm going to look at it from the other direction. I mean, you're looking at it in terms of the cumulative effects of total exposure. I'm looking at it maybe from the different vantage point, the cumulative effects of total exposure on a dose first, which is the only way you can link it back to children's products and other sources, rather than the effects on the body. I mean, we have to have a clear definition of what we're looking at here because none of, everything you said is correct, but I don't know how I can basically link in any, one of, any one of those statements back to children's products or other sources such as personal care products. How, how do I do that? I mean, we're talking about biological effects here that you're, talk, you're, you're discussing. I'm looking at this as a little bit of a different twist to the question because what we're being asked here in this room is to deal with the issue of whether we're going to ban the use of this chemical yeah. in certain products, and I don't see we haven't come to that conclusion yet from what you've just said. It's true what you're saying, but I don't think that's what this question is asking. You're getting at the, the central question of extrapolating animal data to, to humans yeah, and what's and required to do that. especially for individual products. Yes. It's, it's almost I mean, I'm not sure how I can do that at this point. I mean, it's a, it's, I think this is a really tough question. Pardon? I think there's a toughness in two of those three issues that are in that number four, <clears throat> and I don't know how I would even begin for us to approach whether it comes from personal care products or something else. But even the other two, I think there are two different questions here when you talk about exposure and mixtures. Cumulative exposure is an issue of its own right, regardless of yes. individual chemical or mixture, and I think there are two separate questions. So what is the evidence for cumulative effects from these materials that are absorbed rapidly and eliminated rapidly, mm -hmm. where you wouldn't expect a cumulative effect because they don't build up for a long period of time. So what is the cumulative nature? And second, what is the difference in toxicity from the mixture versus the individual compounds? And one a specific question I would have about what you've already looked at, it has been my feeling in the past that mixtures don't, especially of chemically related structurally related chemicals, it's unusual to find a new target organ. You find enhancement in existing target organs that you knew before. Is there any evidence in this phthalate database for the, a, a new target organ to come because of mixtures? Mm. Can, can I just answer this? Uh, taking your last question first, uh, the answer is no. I'm not, well, I should be more careful. I'm not aware of anything, which doesn't mean it's not there, but I'm not aware of anything. The, your first point, cumulative exposure, that's, I take your point, but partly that's semantic. Cumulative exposure, the language of mixed toxicology is funny and uh, not often very clear and sometimes ambiguous. Cumulative exposure can usually, in this specific area of expertise, means exposure from multiple chemicals via multiple routes and pathways. That's EPA's definition of what cumulative exposure means. You are quite right. It could also be interpreted to mean um, building the building up of levels inside our bodies from exposure to chemicals that uh, just stick around, that are highly persistent and cumulative. Um, I think to simplify or to clarify point number four, I think I would interpret the charge here, the text, uh, that cumulative ex exposures or cumulative effects it talks about is meant in the sense of the effects of combined exposure, simultaneous or sequential combined exposures to several chemicals. Well, that, this discussion brings up a really good point, I think, that we have to be very careful how we define terms. We have to make sure that we yes. define them in either multiple ways and say this is the way we're going to use it uh, or, or talk about it in different ways. But uh, I think it's important that we uh, define our terms 
That's one of our tasks. Now, there's, a, there's another way to look at cumulative effects of total exposure. This is not a constant exposure either. This is a this is like an interval exposure. It could be a frequency effect. So therefore, you could have multiple hits of exposure with high concentrations, and then other times were none. Because especially if you're talking about mouthing a material, it's not going to be all day long. It may be a kid maybe going on vacation. He doesn't see his, you know, mouthing devices for, for two weeks when he comes home. Or he may sees it every day, and when he comes home, he doesn't use them anymore. Because you have no idea how this thing works. You're looking at, you're looking at something that is absorbed, eliminated quickly, and then maybe absorbed again at another time at high concentrations. This is a very ambiguous question to answer. My, yes. Also, in conjunction with point number two, where it says, consider the potential health effects of such of these phthalates, both in isolation and now importantly, and in combination with other phthalates. Hmm. So, to me, I don't know whether I interpret the intention of the legislator here wrongly, but I think that means we should look at mixtures. That's a good point. And that there's an overlap or a link with point number four, which four. we are just discussing. So, yeah, and that's. I think we yeah. need to define it that way. Yeah. No, another point uh, regarding cumulative effect, total exposure. Phthalates have been described by some people as pseudo-cumulative mm. chemicals, meaning that often when the rate of uh, input uh, exceeds or comes close to the rate of elimin elimination, you have either a buildup or at least a building of a steady state. Oh, so, equilibrium. an equilibrium, yes. So. So whichever ever way we interpret it, I think we should look at that and as, at mixtures. I think there's no way out of that. I th it seems to me that's the intention of the legislator. But I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose sight of the second half of that uh, statement from children's products and from other sources such as personal care products. That is going to be a real nut to crack. Uh, that may be simply easy to deal with in the sense that can't. we can't. <laughs> well, I think, but I think we have to just at least be aware of that and understand that there are going to be limitations, and this may be a limitation. Big one. But, uh, you know, again, I, I, one way to interpret it is they want to know children's articles and everything else. Yeah. And as long as the everything else includes personal care products, that's okay. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to single out the personal care products. Yeah. But does it make sense to think about, maybe I'm oversimplifying too quickly, but does it make sense to think about having uh, biomonitoring data sort of be the flag and say, you know, this is where we know we have exposure. It's evident here in humans. Here's the exposure. And that exposure evaluation in terms of risk needs to take into account that there are multiple chemicals that actually individually could be at very, very low levels, right? And mm -hmm. which, so a combination all at individual sub-thresholds, we really could still have an effect. I mean, that's the combination sure. effect, sure. right? So then once, once you have sort of that right side, by a monitoring data to an effect, some kind of a, a, a relationship there, then go back and say, so where did that come from, the exposure we, you know, may, maybe we could explain some from children's toys or whatever, but um, I, I don't think we have to start with explaining the exposure and then going straight to effects without going through the biomonitoring, which is something that evidently wasn't available in the DINP uh, CHAP work. I think we just have to use every sliver of data that's available to try to come up with some understanding of the situation. There's going to be no perfect data set. And we just have to be careful not to overinterpret anything and use it wisely. I, mean, I, I think you're Absolutely. perfectly right. Up to you. How long would you like to break, break for? Questions. Okay, let's take I a 15 minute break. Ambiguous questions. Okay, Thing we'll be back yes, at three. Some of them are. And some of them, as you she saw, overlap and they actually go back on top of each other. I'm more optimistic than you.
That's okay. Uh, you know what's, you know, I'm Yeah, let's reconvene. Uh, although we, we have scheduled a, a fairly extensive break here, I noticed from the schedule I didn't. Oh, oh. But, but uh, it's, it's at the chairman's discretion. Yeah. <laughs> but I think we're, we're all eager to have more uh, detail here, and so let's proceed. Um, so are there any other... You're going to stand, okay? Uh, comments concerning cumulative effects. Have we have we defined the the major questions that we want to address? I think so. I think we're just going to have to come back to this, and when we start thinking about how to address this charge, there may be a variety of different subheadings under this that have to be dealt with. And and one of the things that Burn mentioned at the break was that we really need to define. Uh, what and, and who we might want to uh, have come talk to us, uh, providing yeah. additional information. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go on to uh, five. Um, was an apple pie. Review all relevant data, including the most recent, best available, peer reviewed scientific studies of these ph phthalates and alternatives that employ objective data collection practices or employ other objective methods. Well, that's going to come out of all the information that we've already talked about. So. Sort of like godmotherhood and aqua pie. You know? <laughs> it doesn't... Does it, Phil, so, Phil yeah. there, there is a question <clears throat> that we should address, I think, related to this, <clears throat> and that is whether or not we are going to review for use data that are not published. Well, that it's peer-reviewed information. Look, so are we, are we willing to use data, and if so, what kinds of data? Analytical data, tox data? Shelby Act. I, my instinct would be to restrict it to published peer-reviewed data. Go ahead. I, I would be careful about that because okay. it's the first time we are talking about the late alternatives. And with the, the late alternatives coming onto the market, like DINCH or like DPHP or whatsoever, I think there's a very little scientific peer review data. Well, then we get into the Shelby Act, United States. You know, when we make regulations or making recommendations for regulation, all the information has to be made available for somebody to come and check it make sure we made the right decision. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an act of Congress. So as long as what we use can be made available for somebody to go back and analyze it in the end, once we've gone through it, that's fine. I mean, anything that's a work product from a contractor that we hire will actually have to be made available, and that's, that will be, that's reasonable. Uh, but if, if, we, if we're looking at confidential information that we can't use, you know, beyond, beyond this, we can't use it. And so we have to be, make sure that any data we use that's not published can actually be released to the public, and we're just not going to have confidential information put before us that we cannot touch in a later date, because uh, we have to be able to be subjected to the Shelby Act. I mean... The, the reality is that there's a lot of data on industrial chemicals that's not published in the peer-reviewed literature, uh, but a lot of it is public, yeah. uh, either because it comes from EPA or through EPA or, or it's volunteered by the company. So, I mean, it's the, the, the chap, it's, it's your call how you want to do this, but that's the reality. Um, if I were doing it, I would use the, any data as long as it's public. Now. Data that's not public is another matter. We wouldn't touch that. Um, but again, it's it's your call. Any I'm, comments? I'm on sorry. That? I'm I'm very happy to row backwards here with what I said. I mean, if if there's public data, I'm all for using them, even not in the peer-reviewed scientific le literature. As long as they meet the criteria. As of being long as somebody public. can go back and take our that data and do another analysis on it which everyone's allowed to do, 
I mean, especially when you're dealing with a regulation in which we're making a re recommendation, I think that's fine. But if we can't use it in, in any way, if somebody can't not take that data and use it themselves, I don't want to touch it at this point in time. What about when we're having people come to talk to us about studies that are ongoing that aren't published yet? Um, I mean, then it's the matter of time that eventually it would be published. Can we? If they're willing to let it be released, yes. The problem is that if it's not been published, the, the data belongs to the investigator, and this may be preliminary data, and we cannot force that person to give it to us, but then again, if it's just for information only and we don't go beyond using it for information, but don't use it in terms of deliberations, we're fine. But if, if somebody wants to give us the data to use, they have to recognize that that data in the original form has to be available to anyone. And that's basically the basis of their scientific publication, which is fine. But they have to be informed of that. I'm not sure that will come up. It may. But I think when we were talking about having someone from EPA or, or NIEHS come talk to us, it was more telling us about what is out there in, in the planning stages. I don't know that we were going to ask anyone to provide preliminary data, although that may be a that may be possible if there's something out there. But I think again the same criterion. If, if it's, I think can be in the public domain. If people can tell us anything they want, but it's how we use it afterwards. If they're telling us that they have a study and planned or there's certain preliminary data, fine. That goes just so far. We just can't use it until it becomes firm so that, um, you know, anyone can have access to it and, and use it to make calculations which they think we may have done wrong. We could probably refer to that sort of thing in terms of data gaps. You know, we, we see this data gap and there's this group mm -hmm. that's doing experiments that may address it. Uh, that probably is something we can do. All right, the next uh, criterion to consider the health effects of phthalates not only from ingestion but also as a result of dermal, hand to mouth, or other exposure. Hmm. Say here. Paul, oh, you don't like it, do you? <laughs> oh, no, it's just a lot of hard work. How much, how much work is out there in terms of inhalation on phthalates? But can't we think about that more as a result of in the biomonitoring data? We don't know what the exposure is anyway. Right. So, I mean, if we were limited to only, uh, you know, phthalates of a certain exposure route, that would limit us worse than saying, in terms of biomonitoring, right? Or make it easier. <laughs> I, I would think. Only... I think, Paul, this is the section you're going to write. I yeah, would yeah, imagine. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Well, the question we have is, is where is there enough data? In fact, that may be part of your literature to find out. I think that's what will. Is, is the data available for different routes of exposure or basically we're dealing with, uh, you know, animal studies on, um, you know, from ingestion? I mean, there, there, there's not a lot. I know. Uh, <laughs> there's a few studies that address, very few that address inhalation, house dust, that sort of thing, but yeah. very few. Uh, dermal, I mean, there's data on dermal absorption rates um, and so on, uh, so you could do some scenario-based type thing. Uh, there, you know, there are risk assessments, exposure assessments, but not a lot of data. Sorry, I'm interpreting that different, I think, than what you all are okay. speaking about. Um, Thanks. I was reading that more. You're talking about uh, Roman numeral six. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Consider the health effects of phthalates. I love coffee too. And then, but the not only it seems coffee. to me is a list of, of possible exposure routes. So we're really just talking about health effects of of phthalates is the way I was looking at that. Instead of saying here's what it is from dermal, here's what it is to handle. Oh, method. okay. Yeah. I mean, though, in, the, in that case, there's even fewer. <laughs> I, I would ag agree with you, Chris. I, th I think, you know, in 
terms of maybe the way this was framed or written is really they're concerned about phthalates and children's products, which may pose a risk, but also recognizing that there's other sources of phthalates that may also pose a risk and consider that when you do a, not, a cumulative risk assessment or assess sure risk. I understand that. That's I'm still confused. exposure route, isn't it? Right, but I don't think it's it's prescribing that they're that this would want to you know a uh, assessment to look at what's the risk from route A, route B, route C. I think it's really Why not? I, I'm just that's just the way I'm reading it because of what this this is embedded in a, this is a public law and I think that they were concerned with um, phthalates and children's products. But when you're considering the health risk from those phthalates that the child may be ingesting, also consider that that child's being exposed through potentially dermal inhalation, diet, and other routes that may then contribute to that child's body burden and potential health risk. So but, can but actually, you can actually define forward. You can't do it backwards from biomarker, but you can define the daily intake dose from inhalation, dermal, and ingestion, and then figure out if any one of them have any relationship to the final biomarker levels or the levels that you're concerned with in terms of a potential health effect, because that's where the rubber meets the road for us, where once we say there's a daily intake from inhalation, dermal, and ingestion, then we can actually start figuring out which, which types of, of uh, situations may or may not be of in any influence whatsoever. and. You know, is it still the fact that children's, you know, mouthing objects are still most important? Yeah, well, I guess I was reading it more generally that, that this um, law is in terms of trying to understand the risk, but also consider that there's other sources than just from a teether or from a child's mm -hmm. toy, but not asking us to do a risk assessment for phthalates from dermal exposure, phthalates from air, or phthalates how from... Do we, how do we differ? Like, let's say, <coughs> let's say we have, you know, um, tents, all right? Have what? Tents, all right? A tent? Tent, you know, yeah, right? yeah. Or, you know, other kind of things that we use that may have phthalates. And the number, the possibility for exposure from that is, you know, X. And then you say, well, based upon either dermal or ingestion or inhalation from X, it may be that from, from that, from those tents may be so small compared to <clears throat> X prime from, you know, a teether that you don't consider it. And again, when we're considering banning something, you want to consider banning based upon a position of strength, that the exposures are de minimis. But I, I mean, I think they, they don't want us to ignore, as we did in the past, you know, where we said, well, the exposure is coming mainly from mouthing. They want us to also Quantify. consider, not necessarily, well, if, you, if you're doing a scenario-based risk assessment, they don't want us to ignore dermal or inhalation. I, I that's what I think they're getting at. I agree. At. But in what sense not ignore? I mean, we can document studies that show dermal or inhalation or ingestion exposures. Is that where we stop? Or do we go beyond that and say, you know, those routes of exposure in, in this population are minimal and we're going to disregard or... I mean, I'd rather have a contract to do a daily intake dose based upon a few pertinent scenarios for different types of products and use that as the, you know, potential intake from those routes. That's how we define whether or not on the scale of 1 to 10 that route of exposure has any meaning for a health effect. I mean, that, that would be a reasonable thing to do and it meets our charge. Uh, any other comments on that? I think this is an important point that we you have to... Heading, Chris? Yeah, but I'm maybe... Okay, maybe <laughs> I'm in a, in, a, in a rut here, but I'm, I'm thinking... I'm still am thinking biomonitoring data is the flag. Biomonitoring data is telling us what the exposure really is, and I know there are caveats of, of, of you know, what levels we're measuring, and, and maybe in children it's more difficult or, or whatever, but it's clear there's exposure that has taken place. You can't explain mm -hmm. what the exposure is, perhaps, but you can say there's exposure here. So given those levels of exposures, those numbers of chemicals, what's the health effect side of that? 
and then go back and say, okay, so th for that level of exposure, we would expect, you know, these teething products or these whatever. We're uh, saying the same thing. We just yes. have to do the calculations separately because there's no way for a exposure for exposure to explain the the. That's the, right. The, you yeah. have to do those separately, and what you have to do is, you have to come up with realistic assumptions about what the kind of contacts will be so that you can make meaningful judgments as to defining what the intake dose would be and then maybe we can actually do some modeling or have somebody do some modeling to figure out whether that those levels can actually lead to a level of metabolite in the body through pharmacokinetics. We can do the forward, we can't do the backward. The backward's impossible right now, but the forward you can do and you can do some calculations that can help maybe explain that well, within, with, within this particular situation that if you have X contribution from inhalation, the amount that you'd see in the biomarker, meaning the metabolite, would be so minuscule it wouldn't be picked up. But if you have something where it's from ingestion, you could actually do a pharmacokinetic analysis and say, yeah, bio, from the standpoint of this bio, particular biomarker, this particular metabolite, you may actually be able to see within the range of detection that level. Yes? Um, I guess you are after weighing the relative importance of various routes of exposure, am I right? Well, that's, that's the question I think that we're... we're and we're my, my reading of this charge is that we have to take into consideration all routes, mm -hmm. and I think that's really important, but I don't think we're required to weigh the relative importance. How do we, how do we make a judgment? But what, what do you, then we get into definitions, what do you mean by take into consideration yeah. different routes? So as yeah, in it, for as example, uh, you know, we have the feeling and there's data to suggest that uh, uptake via food is very important and that point is taken. However, we are, this, I interpret this text to mean that we are not supposed to just look at food but we should consider other routes as well. For example, dermal uptake from personal care products, etc., etc. But just document that those can and or do occur is what you're saying. That's the level of... Or, or another way of putting so. it would be that, you know, let, let's say diacinonal or DH, one, one of the phthalates, there's a two microgram per kilogram per day exposure. But we also know that that child may be exposed to five micrograms from personal care products. I'm just making up numbers, eight sure. from air, et cetera. Keep that into account that that child's body burden is you know, mm. 20 micrograms, and they're getting, you know, 18 from other sources and two from the toys when you consider the potential health effects of that phthalate. I but mean, that's, that's, that's the way that's, I would. That's exactly what I said we had to do. But, well, to, I, I think we have to weigh it, but I don't think we have to then determine well, read, read the number risk. Seven. Read number seven, and then you'll know why I'm not going to back down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, number seven, I think, is very far-reaching and I think would require a lot of discussion in terms of You're going to have to our... We're going to have to quantify at some point. And it's either in for six or for seven. I'd rather do it for six because then I don't have to do as many of sevens as I would have to if I quantified for six. If I can do exactly what you say, Russ, I can discount X, discount Y, discount Z, and only deal with Q, I'll be happy. But I'm wondering in number seven, maybe Andreas and Chris, I mean, does that seem accomplishable, number seven? I mean, it's a very ambitious... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, to me, there's a lot in the semantics, you know, there is reasonable certainty, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, I, I think. Something will be accomplishable, I'm sure. I still have to say, you know, the, the whole concept of no harm has to be defined. What we mean by that. Is it one in a billion, one in a million, one in a thousand? You have in there children and pregnant women, so you have a very different potential risk to a, a fetus versus a child. 
Yeah. Well, they did it for arsenic and drinking water. I guess we can do it for phthalates and whatever. I mean, again, depending on the endpoint, are you going to have a um, an estimate of risk, or are you going to have a, you know, we're above a certain level of concern or or below it? Um, this is something that developmental toxicologists are very sensitive to because, um, you know, teratogens get in to the fetus or embryo and different roots, and some of them are, are less of a problem depending on the on the chemicals. Some of them are are more of a problem and so it seems to me that at least when we're talking about pregnant women that that the root of exposure is going to be an important consideration and and what that contributes to the possible burden um, and especially since in seven we're, we're supposed to make a risk assessment right so and I don't know how you do that without we need some intake doses and if we if we are able to prioritize them based upon some quantitative estimates with various realistic scenarios for six, we're in much better shape. Yeah. I think we can calculate intakes from two ways. One way is from biomonitoring data, which is an integral measure of all routes and sources of exposure. We can get a pretty good estimate on what is the exposure for different populations based on biomonitoring data. But I go along with you too that uh, if we see that uh, for some populations and some phthalates or the phthalates cumulatively taken together, there is a problem because we reach doses which are close to or over the tolerable daily intakes, then we still have to investigate the roots. And this can only be done with the models for the products, for the toys, for application of, of personal care products and so on. Looking back over this, wh wh why do I have the, the, in, the, the, the thinking that we're focusing just on children? If I, I just review this quickly, um, I don't think it says anything about children. It, it, it's talking about children's toys, but it's not talking about just limiting it to children. Seven says children or pregnant women or susceptible. Or other. <laughs> or other. Well, I mean, yeah. that's me, I, other. You're you susceptible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, um, I hope they're not meaning genetically susceptible. Yeah, that would be tough. I mean, are we really talking about exposure to humans, not with particular, particular thought on children? But are, or is it wrong to say, let's just focus on children, including fetuses, infants, all the way through adolescence. Also says, or other susceptible individuals in their offspring. So I think there's, they're still kind of coming back to the child or the, or the fetus, at least my reading of it. Of the child? Yeah, because it's, because then it, it says, or other susceptible individuals in their offspring. I don't know, women that may be more susceptible. It's vague, yeah, I'm not sure what that means. Actually. Yeah. <clears throat> Only pregnant women have offspring, as far yeah. as I know. No, yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> but then at the end, it says, and other potentially susceptible individuals, semicolon. So it doesn't. I think it's a catch all for, you know to cover their backs. But do we, is this a point where we want to focus? Are we going to focus on children or are we going to, are we going to say we're interested in phthalates on humans? Uh, they are human too, aren't they? No, I think it's sort of the legislator wants us to, <laughs> to think very hard that every, every eventuality is covered. covered. That's how I interpret yeah. it. That's a good point. Don't you think? Yeah, yeah I agree. And again, I think this is another instance in which we have to define what we mean by potentially susceptible individuals. And we may say we don't know what this population is. Or I would say based on animal data, we can reasonably predict which are susceptible subpopulations. And for me, in the end, it's uh, all women in their reproductive age, and it's all 
children until they are until their puberty. So all uh, mechanisms that uh, are regulated by antiandrogen and disrupted by phthalates, possibly. So in the end, in, in the beginning, the window seems pretty tiny from the animal studies, gestational day 15 to 17. But in the end, hmm. it is from. That, that is true if we think uh, reproduction and development, but that's probably not true if we think cancer. Yes, mm -hmm. of course. Is there enough data on the cancer issue to have that as a meaningful endpoint for our discussions? Well, that's not uh, an option for us to decide. The legislator said you look at everything. We discussed that already. But aren't we going to prioritize the effects also at some point? Yeah, yeah we discussed already that very likely developmental and uh, effects and reproduction is important and cancer probably others too but these two definitely and cancer is uh, uh, it's mainly the liver cancer and for some phthalates they cause liver cancer in rodents the problem is that they're caused by this mode of action which uh, probably most people would say is not relevant to right. humans although there's one paper just came out that uh, um, uh, sort of reopens the question but but uh, you know there's a good chance that they're not relevant to humans those tumors um, so I'm not sure you know depending on your perspective that might not be uh, uh, a high priority endpoint This this seems like kind of a last minute catch all yeah. thing that was thrown in here after the priority questions were already established. <clears throat> I don't think this changes the focus of this review from children. Okay. I think instead this is kind of looking ninety degrees and saying, are there any other populations that are even more sensitive than children? Right. Yes. Just generally, where where this. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, yeah, but the level at which there's a, no, a reasonable certainty of no harm. <clears throat> I think they're they're looking to see if they may have missed something that they would want to follow up on at some later time, or if it's sufficient just to focus this all on children. And then the next question is, we have looked at phthalates, now look at things other than phthalates, look at the substitutes. So I see those two as kind of cleaning up the, the whole thing here and bringing those two last questions in after they've already addressed the priority ones that relate to children. That's how I look at both of these. Um, I think you're right, but I think eight actually says that they came back to their senses because they're only talking about children's toys and children's care articles rather than these right. other sensitive subgroups. So maybe they went off target in seven, but they at least came back toward the target in eight. <laughs> they came back to the real world. <laughs> but I, think if, I think if we attempted to do the, the whole picture, it would detract from our ability to look at children. Right. And that's what I see as the primary focus. Primary focus. I agree. So the pregnant women is there just for the fetus? And whatever ex different exposure levels may be? Uh, that, I think... It, that's my opinion, and unless we see more specific recommendations that say, look, look specifically to see if non-pregnant women are different from pregnant women, then I think it's a different question. But I, I don't see that in here. Well, one of the other susceptible populations could be uh, adult males, correct? And True. so we could, you know, say that and, and give a paragraph to that, but have the main focus be on, on children from the embryo fetus through sure where we have to define that young children adolescents I don't know it's obviously a continuum but yeah, where does it end for females or for males that's the question I, I have. mean for males it I mean it doesn't end but it's just the fetus is more susceptible than the, the juvenile which is more susceptible, more sensitive than the adult. Yeah. Adults just need a higher 
dose. Paul, it ultimately ends with death. <laughs> oh, hell. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay. Um, well, obviously, we're going to have to still um, sort some things out with respect to, to six or seven and eight. Um, Bern, do we want to? Turn now to the point that you brought up. That might be a good time to do it now. A, a strategy, I think, uh, a question we need to deal with. A, a strategy on how we would approach this whole task mm -hmm. so that we don't choke on it at some point. And that the, there are maybe more options than these two, but in just in terms of my thinking, this is as far as I got. <clears throat> One approach is for us to proceed chemical by chemical and address the questions that there are to describe the potential risks of these phthalates and the substitutes relative for that or for that one specific chemical at a time, approaching whether we would make recommendations for either continuing the ban or for creating a ban or for changing the ban that does exist. And that th there is a rationale for doing that. <clears throat> but the other approach is to not start our discussions chemical by chemical, but concept by concept. And the one that I think we're most likely to stumble over is what is this threshold for acceptable risk. And to some extent that's independent of chemical, but if we start out chemical by chemical, we are certainly going to end up with the first chemical trying to decide what is acceptable risk. And then the possibility is that we would have to go through that discussion each time because now the, the scenario is different. There are different kinds of data, different kinds of exposures, uh, et cetera. And I think we've all been on committees where that discussion consumed a huge amount of time compared to everything else if you let it go too late. So the possibility is that we would approach this from the standpoint of looking at some kind of rules of operation of thinking that we would agree to before we have DEHP in front of us or before we have one of the phthalates where there is very little information. And the, the, this, the approach then becomes skewed because there is no other DEHP here. And <clears throat> so th those are two scenarios that we might consider as we approach how are we going to most efficiently use our time and not have to revisit issues because we didn't take certain things into consideration when we discussed this earlier. So I would pose to you for discussion whether we might approach these in a what would seem like a sensible way, going chemical by chemical, or do we delay that and talk first about some concepts of doing risk assessment and then apply them to the chemicals in the, in the orderly way or do it all phthalates at a time, however you would want to do that. Comments? I think this my gets to the instinct, heart of how we're deal with this. My instinct would be to go for the second approach, which which you outlined, the conceptual one, uh, for for a simple, straightforward reason. The charge is to look at not only phthalates in isolation, we have to do that as well, but to to consider them in combination. If we pursue the first approach, chemical by chemical, and then uh, discuss chemical by chemical whether continuation of the ban should be recommended or not, I think we're missing a great chunk of the spirit and the intention of the legislator. So I would favor your second approach. I totally agree. I think that's the only wise way of doing it. <laughs> we have agreement. Anybody else? Hold it. 
I think we should uh, define the basis for our risk assessment approach in terms of tolerable daily intakes. What is tolerable, what is not? Do we scoop out these intake levels to a certain degree for one phthalate? What do we do with a bunch of the phthalates? Yeah, I would say definition of the, the risk assessment approach we choose. Hearing no other comments, I think that's the approach we should take is have the general discussion. The, the obvious question is then how do we proceed to do that? Do we do that using our own expertise or do we need expertise outside of this body? Over. So what do we need for the risk assessment? We need endpoints, we need effect levels, we need as a basis for discussion the tolerable daily intake levels for all of the phthalates and possibly later on the replacement products. I think we need this basic data from the beginning on. So the there, basic there, is, there is an interesting report uh, also from the National Academy of Sciences about uh, risk assessment in the 21st century and there's a very thought-provoking chapter in there which um, is very critical of these numbers, these quantities that usually come out of toxicological risk assessment and instead calls for focusing rather on action before we take those numbers too seriously and then they begin to assume a life of their own and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So I wonder if we go down your route number two whether it would be timely and appropriate to perhaps ask a panel member from that report to um, come to visit us and explain this a little further. I think that's a, that's a good suggestion. Bernie, what? And coming back to your question, do we bring in outside people to talk to us or do we start through? My suggestion and my feeling is that we have enough experience around the table that if if we invite other people in for a day to talk about this, all we're going to do is delay our own discussion to see if we reach agreement. And I think our time is more productively spent discussing this within this group instead of bringing in outside people early on. And I would bet that we could reach a discussion about a strategy for doing a risk assessment of a phthalate that will be beneficial to CPSC in the future for other phthalates and I'm not sure we need to bring in other experts to, to tell. If we fail, if we try this and fail, well, then we can bring somebody else in. Over. Yeah, very much like your approach, Andreas. But uh, if we want to add up exposures to risks, we to a certain extent need the numbers to do this addition. But if we encounter problems on this way, maybe then we might need the ad the, the advice of, of uh, other people in this field. Yes, the, the, uh, I listened to a talk given by Joe Rodericks, who I think he chaired this, or no, he didn't, but he was on the panel. And he, uh, and he, he uh, actually very eloquently explained this. Um, I took what he said to mean that numbers, of course, are not un, unimportant, of course, we are we need them, but his emphasis was to focus on risk assessment as a decision support tool rather than emphasizing too much the mechanics and the quantitative outcomes, which I think is a very important point. But I don't know, we can, um, the book is out, it's the silver book, Science and Decision, came out in 2009. We can all read it, huh? maybe then. It's a good report. It's it's not, it's going to help us do the framing, but it's, it's still when it comes down to doing the work, we're going to have to have some contractors do these calculations for us, and we just have to decide how we're going to do it in such a way that it's meaningful us for prioritization of both the potential effects we want to consider in long term and the potential exposures we want to evaluate in the nearer term. 
Uh, I think the first course of, of any, in this whole process is to get all this background information for us mm -hmm. and maybe having somebody assimilate some of it in such a way that we don't have to go looking at disparate locations for information. I'm, I'm mostly concerned in terms of starting off with the endpoints that are the most crucial and where are we going to go from there because that's going to define a lot of the things that are going to cascade out from that both in terms of biomarker data and in with work, work with respect to, you know, intake doses that we're going to have to do later on. Well, Mike, how are we going to, how are we going to do this? I mean, you, you are going to search and provide us with all the, the data, but um, at least in some areas that's going to be huge. Um, are, are you going to then expect that we will look at that and sort out what we think is important and put together and present to the, the panel at a future meeting or is, is there some uh, way that your staff can summarize literature in different areas and provide? In, ter in terms of the literature. Uh, we can, uh, you know, start by doing a, a search and, and get a, a handle on what there is for these other compounds. Um, and from there, uh, we might either ourselves or possibly a contractor do some kind of a summary. And it's a matter of, uh, you know, do you simply want a summary of what's available for starters? Uh, are you going to? Do you, you know, do you want us to derive uh, ADIs or whatever, uh, or s lay out the data? It, it, it's a matter of uh, how, how much you want and how much, or what you need and what the, how much data there is, whether we can do it or whether we're going to ask, uh, need help. Um, and it's, I think, uh, I would say suggest doing it sort of stepwise. First, see what's there. Um, see how bad, <laughs> how is. big the problem is. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, get a little more detail about of you know exactly what you what you need. Do you want us to pick out particular endpoints or or whatever it is? Because I, I know some of these data. There's going to be. Uh, uh, a tip, typically, y you will get a couple, you know, thousand pages of LD50s, like, mm -hmm. over and over. Mm -hmm. Did it LD50 on Tuesday, and on, guess what? Next week, it was the same. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, a few of these chemicals, there's going to be, they're going to be data rich, but a, lo a lot of them, I think it's going to be data poor. Um, and it's also, we don't know for so many of these, we don't know what the exposures are going to be anyway. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we'll think about this before we uh, invest to exactly what we're doing before we invest too much. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, uh, uh, you know, certainly we can gather data, we can uh, you know, depending again, depending on the the amount of the task, uh, uh, the size of the task, we can come. Oh, do some sort of analysis. Uh, get together the uh, what no effect levels or whatever it is, dose response data, whatever we can find, um, uh, as much as you want to do. But um, in the um, I guess in the end, we would want to know exactly what you, you know, you want, you want is to identify the endpoints or, uh, and then do the, you know, look for quantitative data, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, um, I, I, I'm still a little unclear on, uh, you know, for all of these chemicals, uh, for, you know, there's only 10 where there's biomonitoring data. So we have no idea what the exposure to these others are. Um, um, so um, uh, I'm a little hesitant to, s I know there are some chemicals like isobutyl that we want to add. Uh, 
others. Uh, I'm not so sure we need to do all of that, but the first course we can see how much data there, there are. And there are, there are other reviews too. Uh, the uh, Australian government has uh, 21 reviews. Uh, so they've actually done that. I mean, they're, they're very concise reports. Uh, very matter of fact, they sum up the data. This is what we have. Uh, you know, this is what's available. This is what the studies say. Um, and I have a feeling anything beyond those chemicals, you're not going to find much. Um, uh, but, de you know, definitely uh, I, I would, uh, we need to expand the list at least a little bit. And also a lot, I think maybe some of this, you know, there's a point where uh, you, you just, uh, you're looking at the phthalates as a class. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe some of these can be consolidated to some of these chemicals uh, can be solid, consolidated into groups because some of them are closely related. Um, but Can anyone on the panel give Mike any guidance in terms of what they'd like to see uh, in, in this uh, data search? You know, I think this is a, obviously a very huge task. Um, I, I think that if at the end of the day we end up with a list of a bunch of chemicals and a list across the top of a bunch of endpoints, we're still not addressing the issue of, you know, overall effect and the effect of the, of the mixtures, of the combinations. Um, and I don't, I don't know, and it, it might be that if we start saying, you know, I'd, I'd like to look at it this way, <laughs> that, that, that then you're starting to get contractors involved or or things like that, and I, I don't know at what point it becomes out of the scope, but um, it seems to me at the end of the day, if, you know, you're talking about reproductive developmental effects, even just designating yes or no, there was a environment, uh, there was a reproductive developmental effect, it could have been one of many different things, but there was, on this animal, yes, there was. And, and combining uh, effects that, that way, um, and, um, of course, if you're talking specifically about, you know, phthalate syndrome, the, the structure activity relationship is fairly clear. So we could, you know, look at the structure and have a pretty good idea whether uh, it's going to be active or not. Um, uh, of course, other things are a little bit, it, you know, it depends on the endpoint, but the other thing is what do you need to do the risk assessment, I mean, I don't see how you can do it without a, a TDI or an ED50 or some other measure of potency. Um, uh, you know, there's just no other way to do it. And, and for example, uh, for a given endpoint, uh, you know, even if you look at the, re even if you look at the phthalate syndrome effects, there's a range of effects from the continuous uh, drop in testosterone, how much before you consider it uh, um, an adverse effect, the, you know, AGD uh, up to the malformations and so on. So, uh, you know, do you want to consider the same endpoint in for all of these? I mean, do you want to pick one? Do you want to look at a number of them? Um, I suspect that the dose responses are different. For the dose response, uh, Earl Gray showed a slide, it had no data points, just lines. But it, it looked like the, some of the, the, you know, the AGD testosterone production were, had a very linear dose response. The malformations, cryptorchidism, whatever, looked very nonlinear. Um, so, um, but, it, it, I mean, it comes down to what do you want? What, what do you need to do the cumulative risk assessment? Do you need ADIs, T, ADIs, TDIs? Do you want ED somethings um, or a slope or, you know, I think um, at some point we, we need to know what the, um, 
the current the denominator is going to be for that for doing that um, and uh, you know not just is it repro developmental but what the endpoint is that you um, that you want to use <laughs> I guess the decision what is needed in terms of data, input data for cumulative risk assessment is a task in its own right. Mm -hmm. So this we can't just decide right now, but right. maybe we should isolate that as an issue already to set aside and to be considered uh, separately. But because I, I mean, this is, uh, this is not something you can do in a Wednesday afternoon. It right. I mean, there were obviously just the question data requirements. That that certainly was discussed uh, in the NRC report. Ways to do that, but that might not necessarily be the only way, and it might not necessarily apply to all the endpoints. Um, but you know, eventually, to to get to the question of, I, I mean, there has to be a number. I don't see any other way way around it. But does this get us back to Burns' point? Um, is if we and and I think Helger made the point. If we come up with a a method of an approach, you know, if we the details of the approach that we're going to take, and then back out and say, okay, so what kind of data do we need for that approach? As a you know, I, I hate to just task you all with go find all of this yeah. without any real boundary. Um, that at the end would just be a lot of stuff we couldn't that wouldn't be specific to the things that we needed. Um, yeah, and and you know the you you don't maybe you don't know until you see the data. Uh, you know, it's a matter of uh, this one's better. Now that I have the data, uh, this is the only way to do it, or something. I mean, you know, we'll we'll do what we can. Uh, we'll see what's available. Uh, what if, what if I ask it this way? What uh, about um, finding? The, the most complete data set or the be, the data set with the most with the in, with the best endpoints or something some quality step yeah. let us do analyses or do whatever we want with that and then ask the question is there anything out there that would have informed this differently than what we have at the end as opposed to just going out and finding okay yeah I mean that works um, this can be a you know a continuous thing um, you know hit the uh, get the most important, uh, the most glaring deficiencies first, isobutyl and so on. Uh, um, but, uh, yeah, we can do that. But, but if we've, we've already decided we favor um, approach number two, right. driven by risk assessment concepts. Right. But my, and, and I, I really like that. Uh, the, the advantage of this is also that a lot then resolves itself in terms of data requirements. This is the organizing principle that will help us to decide what kind of data we need. Just to make sure I have this in my own mind in a correct way, <clears throat> we're, we're really looking for two different things. One is the question of the additivity or lack of additivity of effects from a mixture. But there still remains the question of if we review the data on the individual chemicals and find out that the permissible level in a product is too high based on the migration and the sensitivity, that's, that's independent of the mixture question. True. So we, we need data on both of those in order to be able to do the risk assessment. And from the standpoint of looking at the effects of the mixture, it would seem to make sense to not cast the net as wide as we possibly could for an effect that was seen in one phthalate, in one study, as opposed to looking at what, is, what are the small number of responses that are common across phthalates. Right. And where we have data that it's, re, it's, it's a repeatable observation, not unique to one study by one person. And if we can't find useful information coming out of that kind of an exercise with a, with a change, with a biological effect that is common across phthalates, the likelihood that we would find it for an observation in one study, one phthalate, is even smaller. So 
in terms of the endpoints that we would want to have data on, I, I think we could narrow that down based on what we already know, what you've told us. Yeah. It, it's up here is, to, is, to some extent. I think the approach uh, as the list of chemicals gets longer would be to go not chemical by chemical, but endpoint by endpoint. And, you know, this is the endpoint. These are the chemicals. That might be the best way to organize the data. Organize that slide. I, I, I'm still struck with the idea, though, that although there could be a cutoff of, of an individual chemical, that I think what you're saying, it, um, it's, it's the combination of fact that I'm, I think we still just need to think about it. I can't imagine that there would be a cutoff for a single chemical that wouldn't be if there are chemicals that are acting in a similar way in some sense. Um, that it wouldn't, that by considering the mixture, it actually is a lower level than an individual chemical. If it's an additive effect. Hmm. We don't know if it's additive. There could be inhibitory effects, too, where a phthalate would occupy a receptor, and, then, and the other one that you normally see as a testicular toxicant now doesn't have access right. to that receptor. So it is less toxic than it was before. So the, the effects right. of mixtures are not always predictable. I mean, I know it's, a, it's that theoretical. Hasn't happened. Okay, it's just theoretical. Well, in but for other chemicals, it's it, for the, for phthalates, it's you know they seem to. I mean, it's almost amazing that you don't see inhibition and so on. But um, for phthalates, it seems to well phthalates for the particular endpoints, mm -hmm. it's additive. Everything else, uh, I I'm not aware of any actual data. I mean, it's. If any assessments you do would be based on just assumptions, I would oh. think. Okay. I would start it simple. The, the, the dose additivity we would restrict to a certain endpoint. To do this calculation, we need the individual information on the phthalates. So it all starts with looking at the endpoint for the individual phthalates, and then we can speculate on those additive effects in terms of uh, doses. Yes. yes. Exactly. I agree with you totally. I mean, we have to start simple. We have to start with what we can learn. And until we do that, we can't even think about the exposure part. You guys have to give us some idea as to what you're looking at as your biological endpoints and the meaningfulness of various compounds to reach that endpoint, either additively, singular, or synergistically, because without it, we'll be lost, because we can't make any, any kind of uh, exposure and then dose estimates without it. So I think that's the fundamentally where we have to start and keep it as simple as possible, because if we, if we start looking at various trees, we're going to lose, lose sight of the goal. I'm a little bit unclear, though, how that gets back to what you suggested that we had the expertise to do here in this committee. Have we done that in this discussion, or? No, we haven't. I didn't think so. Uh, I think the, the issue of what is acceptable, what is an acceptable risk level for chemicals that have a high environmental background level in existence that we're not going to be able to reset to zero is a discussion that we need to have because that's the real world for the phthalates. <clears throat> so I would propose that perhaps tomorrow we could start a discussion about acceptable risk for an environmental chemical for which there is an existing background level that is going to be there for a long time yet. Because it's against that reality that we have to decide what is an acceptable risk above what's created by the normal background. And are we already? I mean, I don't know if we're at a risk level for phthalates or not. That was your question earlier. We, we don't know for sure. But I think that's a discussion that we still need to have. Okay. Do we need anything uh, provided to support that discussion, or is this something we can? Well, yes, but I think it, it, it's around the table. Okay. And the discussion, it, it would be great if, for those of us who haven't read this other report that you were talking about, Andreas, it would be helpful if we could have a few minutes of, of uh, assistance from people who have read 
insightful documents that some of the rest of us haven't looked at yet, mm -hmm. that would be a place to start yeah. this discussion and update us on current thinking from the Joe Rodericks of the world, right. for whom I have a lot of respect. And then we can see how, how, do we, how do we use that current thinking to address the question of mm -hmm. acceptable risk to a phthalate. I mean, Paul. Yeah. You can go, Andreas. No, please. You were going to answer his no. question, no. so uh, I'll, I'll defer to you. <laughs> go, 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 go. Uh, I could tell a joke about uh, Iranian twin pregnancies now, but we need a joke. I think at this point. Yes, we need a joke. <laughs> <laughs> They're the longest in the world. Did you know this? Because when it comes to birth, the one twin goes, no, after you, and the one, no, no, after you, you go first, no, you go first, and so on. Anyway, just so remind right, right, right. <laughs> Anyway, what, in answer to the issue here, um, we could do that, what, what you said, Ben. Um, in addition, for example, um, I could... Uh, we've just published a first attempt at cumulative risk assessment for these chemicals and related agents. And if you wish, I could uh, give a brief presentation about this tomorrow. It, it might help. Yeah. Good. I think we need to make all this more concrete. Yeah. Uh, at least for someone coming from my perspective, where I don't do this sort of thing, never have, and so. Um, now, are, are you talking about the paper? The paper with the uh, synergism? No, no, not that one. Uh, that would feed in there a little, but uh, it's this another one. Uh, Cor what? Yeah, Court Incumbent Faust, uh, a cumulative risk assessment on phthalates and other antiandrogens. I mean, is it in print yet? It's published. Okay. Um, but only just 2010. What journal? International Journal of Andrology. Okay. Um, I don't know if I can get it by tomorrow, but I'll see what I can do. See if we can get a copy of it for the... If you get the PDF, could you uh, pass it on to me as well? <laughs> <laughs> I only have one for, for uncorrected proofs. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a matter of uh, uh, how soon I can get it. Oh, gosh. Problems of publishing. I know, it's so tough now. Okay, so we, we've just got one. our agenda set for well, tomorrow. Can I have yes, one you. question? Mm -hmm. um, to, I guess, take uh, the point of Burns a little bit farther, do you guys have the data that CDC has published on phthalates in uh, biomarkers, in the biomarkers for phthalates? Because it'd be really interesting, I think, for us to get a perspective of what the range values are right now. Because if we're going to establish a baseline somewhere, the only way baseline we're going to be able to start with are baseline levels that are biomarker data to at least understand where we're sitting. So, I mean, some of this, I don't even know whether all these are above non-detect or not. I haven't looked at it in the last couple of years. No, it's more like, yeah, 90 percent detects, but... but... But I think it's important for us to understand what's out there right now in terms of there have they've had three reports i believe right and i'd like to see those data in terms of the three reports separated by uh, percent frequency and by percent frequency by age because i think that's important for us to consideration and i think that's a reasonable amount of data we need to at least start with burns idea of what's background and what's above background just want to add to the enhanced data, which is very valuable. But I think there is one point that has been overlooked all the time in interpreting enhanced data in terms of exposure. Enhanced data is urine data after fasting. Yeah. Um, and when calculating back to exposures, this has always been neglected. This so this might look, this is just be an issue to discuss. Yeah. That's, a, that's an important detail, but just to get an idea of what, what's out there, I mean, you can see, you're going to see there's a large amount of data really low, and there's a few that are really high, and I think just to give ourselves a perspective, that's all I'm looking at at this point, not the analysis of it. 
I can, I think you have it, the paper yeah. I have together with Antonia. Well, I've, uh, it's, well, it's on the CD. Um, I mean, I have the, the report, the last report, the summary data sit, sit, sitting out on my desk. Um, um, the data we can get, I mean, we can, you can download the, the raw data and do all sorts of analyses, and we may want to do that later on. Uh, but, yeah, I can pull up the... I mean, there's just some simple graphs yeah. that everyone should see from the oldest to the newest. I think it's useful for our people to understand yeah. what it is that we're dealing with, and I think it's important important consideration. Chris has brought up the idea of beer biomarkers you know, a number of times today, and it's good to at least get some feel for what they look like. Another, may I add something? Another thing I always pointed out is that uh, most of the enhanced data that has been published, not the data sets at all, uh, to, uh, the data sets that you can download now, but the most published data is cut off at the 95th percentile. I know. So you don't see the upper five percentiles. You don't see what can happen. You don't see the maximum exposures that could happen when you chew on something or some. That's why I want to see the exactly. The we need the raw data functions. until yes. the end. Mm -hmm. Right. Any other requests before tomorrow's meeting? We may have time to discuss our expectations for visitors coming into the meeting next time and presenting information to us. If there are specific things that we want and we think they could address, it would be helpful if we could identify those at, a, at this time. <clears throat> Rather than just take our chances that they'll bring something in that's useful. So, and if, if there are things that we can specifically ask for, it would be good to be able to identify those today and tomorrow. And then we can make those specific requests of the people who are asking for time. And if people want to present information that's outside of our list of what we want as a high priority. Well, one thing we'll do is there'll, there'll be a, you know, a federal register notice in a Post on our website what we want people to present. Right. We can, in as much or a little detail as the panel wants, and it's something we can talk with the chair and the co chair uh, when we prepare it is, you know, what are the specific questions you want to ask uh, uh, of the presenters? That definitely we can do. So tomorrow's discussion, we really need to uh, outline those kinds of questions and potentially who can provide. Or at least uh, to get a good start on them. Yeah. Well, I do think we, at lunch, we said we want to see EPA and we want to see NIEHS at our next meeting. EPA for what they're doing on modeling or, or data analysis and NIEHS for what they're planning to do on more phthalate studies. So I think those are two at a minimum, I think, are priorities for this group. I assume before we, we leave tomorrow, you're going to want to uh, talk about the next time we gather, right? Well, we, we'd like to do that just because it's, it's so diff you know, difficult to get seven people find an open date. And it, it, it might be easier to do when we're all here uh, sitting around the table. Bring your calendars tomorrow. And so that that's something in, in the past what we've done is had actually a three-day meeting. It doesn't have to be, but, you know, one day was the testimony and then two days to meet uh, in person. But again, uh, you know, uh, it's up to the panel in the, in the chair uh, how often, how long. Uh, uh, and so on. Um, but it's the kind of thing we'd want to give, uh, say, you know, uh, people would want at least, uh, you know, 45 days notice, something like that, before to prepare for the testimony and so on. Uh, so, you know, we're talking um, uh, maybe a couple months from now, uh, two or three months. 
bring us into August. Never get well. Us. August in Washington. Uh, I don't think you know. Vacation. I think we're talking uh, June, June or July. July, June. We could do. We could do late June. June. Late June. Week. Okay, we could try for that. Um. August, uh, Washington kind of shuts down. Yep. Um, although we'd probably have the place to ourselves. <laughs> it's also hot. Well, late June sounds good to me. Okay. Let's any any other issues that we want to cover today, Mike? You any suggestions? Um, of what we might. I I don't. Um, have anything uh, specific yet for today? I think we've got an awful lot done, um, and and I think we've got a great start. Um, um, it's you know it's up to the chair if you think we've done enough for today, and if you want to take a break. Uh, the the plan uh, was to reconvene at nine o'clock, but again, that's uh, uh, you know that can be changed. Uh, we can probably do it a little bit earlier if that's what you want to do. Um, I have to leave at 2.30 tomorrow. So do I. To catch a so plane. Yeah, that's early. right. I mean, we do have people uh, leaving a little bit earlier. So if you want to start a little early, that's good. Um, and that's fine. Um, and let's see. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, I think we're good just if you tell me what time. Okay. So what do people think about um, starting at 8 rather than 9? Is that acceptable? It's okay with me. Okay. okay. Start at 8 o'clock. So tomorrow we'll start Start's at 8. breakfast? Well, do you want to, I mean, we can uh, still, still bring in some uh, breakfast for the panel. Uh, I know. Do that earlier or start it at, you know, 8 o'clock, have that at 8. But, uh, like, uh, we could bring, still bring in some food. At, do you want us to bring it in at 8? Yeah, you can start off. Okay. Okay. Uh, one thing to well, well, we'll we'll think about it. tomorrow. We don't have this room because there's going to be another meeting going on. We're going to have to use a room upstairs. So the pan we're we'll have to. Uh, I'll have to actually. There, one of us will take you up. It's just a couple floors up, uh, but we'll have to take you up there. Um, I think we'll just bring you, bring us up there. We'll, I'll try to be there a little bit early. Yeah. And then the, the shuttle will pick up people at. Oh, uh, we'll. That was going to pick us up. Okay. We had scheduled for eight. That that should be fine. Okay. Short ride over here. And then. Yeah. Yeah. And that way. We walk anyway. We can walk and be here by eight o'clock. Okay. We'll I mean, if that's what you want to do, we'll uh, the weather's good. Not far. Okay. So we'll the agenda tomorrow then will be to, to discuss Burns' proposition and how we. Others who want to add. Yeah, that's right. We're going to start with yes. Okay, and uh, yeah, I'll see if I can uh, dig up a copy of that paper and um, yeah, and Haynes' data. Uh, I'm not so sure uh, if I can get have it in a form that you know I've got these. What they have in the report is a, a like a page. Well, this is the wrong, not on the right page, uh, but it's. Um, uh, you know, basically a page or two per, per phthalate, so, mm -hmm. or per metabolite. I, I'm not sure I can get it by tomorrow into a, uh, a, a useful form. 
Um, get but I'll some see. Right. Get some the bet the, the most important. Don't yeah. buy them all. Yeah. You know, because I, I think that I think what we're talking about here is baseline. So you're yeah. talking about the most important phthalates for us to have to consider things as we go along. There's a 2008 uh, report on the environment by the EPA that actually uses 2001-2002 in Haines data well, that, has it, that has it pretty, pretty well summarized. I have a PDF copy of that, if, or at least of that chapter, if you want to. Yeah, but there's a later, there's a later it's data. Much set. later than that, yeah, but if you, I mean, it gives you some indication. Right, are we going to go out tonight? Oh, yes, that's the last thing. Yeah. Oh. Are we going to go for dinner or what? Yeah, sure. Stay up for that? Mm -hmm. These discussions or go on to other things, uh, whatever. Uh, Mike gives is, there a way, yep. is there a way of getting us reservations at a decent well, restaurant? The, what, what I need is the list of restaurants from. There's a